Hello and welcome to the third session of Human the sorry Human Nature and the Technical Object by Cecil Malaspina. Cecilia, you can begin. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, um, can you do a little introduction for the record of of Mr. Slav as well before we start? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to read from the syllabus here. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Lav Kazakov holds a PhD in philosophy and is a certificate student in the New Center's trans Transdisciplinary Studies Program. Born in Spain his whole life in Ukraine, he now lives in Madeira, Portugal, part-time lecturing remotely at Kiev Polytechnic University. His research interests encompass metaphysics of temporality and philosophy of time, both within the context of the speculative turn and aside from it and philosophies of futility and pessimism as a grounding for the project of transcendental catastrophism. The most ambitious of his current studies is Geology of the Night. This project is the elaboration of an ontological and epistemic framework and a transdisciplinary theory fiction research of the night's land, a pioneering speculative sci-fi space horror, masterpiece by British author H.W. Hodgson. Here, Kazakov provides for the text a metaphysics of time through the speculative hypervision of the future as a transcendental catastrophe. Okay, so I'll take it away. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so my current lecture is, as you can see, is not about um, my magistral interests, but uh, it's a result of my engagement into music and into French uh, philosophical thought, namely into Foucault and uh, Deleuze and Guattari. So uh, inspired by the concept of biopolitics of Foucault, I have in my research of particular instances of music production have come to the general universalized idea of technopolitics of things. And uh, similarly to Foucault, this may be briefly uh, defined as a set of power practices and implications over things by those who produce the things. So we I mean use term creators here, so we use both human as a producer and machine as a mean of production and the particular aspects concerning the modes of their productions. But this definition is very not so thorough as it should be. So in a broader sense, we may say that it's an assemblage of first the organization of production, how the production is organized, volumes and scopes of production with regards to market, be it mass market, be it uh, limited uh, edition of things and so on and so forth. The relation of workers to their organization products. So who owns the means of production? Who owns the shares of the company? Uh, so you see a subset like intellectual property policies, patients, uh, copyrights, shareholding, and so on. <laughs> the other component is labor distribution. Also, the reproduction conditions again, by which means, by what means, manufacture. Uh, so it's manufacture, it's a plant factory, it's a third uh, party as a um, con condition conditioner of the reproduction. Then the units of production with regards to material and human resources, the distribution and uh, the resources and materials which have been chosen for the production. Then the relation to uh, research, technology, development, and science, and their implementations, uh, as we will see on the further examples, uh, I will clarify this, what I mean by this relation, and also the relation with the state and international law and conventions. As you see in this list, we have no actual um, um, talk about market relations about the commodity uh, commodification the exchange of commodities and so on and this was made intentionally because we should separate uh the politics of market from techno politics as we should separate biopolitics from social politics for example or incorporate social politics into biopolitics as uh, michel foucault puts it 
And by thing, in the broadest sense, we will refer to such things as products or commodities, services, reified cultural entities, such as you can see a music piece or music album, the artwork, the movie, but not art itself as a, a form of social production, if we reduce it to Marxist uh, definition of art, of early Marx, of his manuscripts of 1844. Uh, 1844, when he said that art is, means, so is one of the ins instances of social production. So, no, we refer just to some reified, ossified object of art. Attributes such as, for example, paid services, which are added to the included, uh, to the existing basic services. Uh, so, book invention, some outcome of social de development. So, everything which is related to production and distribution that can be subject of such production distribution. That is what I mean here by thing when we talk about technopolitics of things. Okay, so in a nutshell, we may uh, universally define technopolitics as an uh, essentialist nutshell. I know that New Center doesn't like me to the essentialism preferring functionalism when we talk for, uh, for example about the intelligence and so on. but uh, we cannot omit the essentialist definition of technopolitics so it's an exercising of power exerted over things their creation their modulation modification patient usage consumption and destruction in uh, many forms or suspension by aptitudes directly related to the body of agent, agent of technopolitics. And no way or, but and indirect mediators, webs of relation in, uh, in a sense of uh, actual network theory, for example, uh, technologies of replication of things, organization and production, distribution and networking, utilization of things, circulation practices and techniques. And speaking of the essentialist nature of technopolitics as exercising of power over things, we may say that there are no alternative entities or uh, universalizing concept aside from technopolitics. So when we think, uh, when we speak and think, when we discuss all this set of uh, activities, practices, and relations, we always speak about technopolitics as a sum of all these possible virtual and actual delusion and distinction ways of uh, manifestation exercising of power over things by the producer by the creator so we may this is the first uh, small list of instances so, uh, for example, we may speak about technopolitics of sound production, technopolitics of music industry, of movie distribution, of home facilities, technopolitics of clothes production, I mean manufacturing, not their selling, for example, through secondhand flea market, we will discuss it. Uh, technopolitics of food production and distribution, which is not the same as technopolitics of culinary art, in the modern epoch of capitalism, for example, we should distinguish between food production in McDonald's, in uh, uh, Ashano Lidl, and culinary art of local cuisine at, at Madeira. No. <clears throat> then technopolitics of book publishing, again, the formats of book publishing, for example, uh, do this uh, publishing, does this publishing deal with ebook with Kindle and with distributing services with format or they have only hard copies hard covers and so on and so forth the politics of record labels by the same token uh, vinyl cd tape or digital distribution digital label uh, or, or technical politics for example of military industry which uh, is a distinct case with regards to international law regulating the product which is uh, exerted which overlaps the intentions of military company which produces military equipment so international law beats here the intentions and governs rules them and this shapes the technopolitics of military industry in far distinct way uh, than for example book publishing which is not related by international law but is overlapped and dominated by for example copyrights uh, issues 
which also uh, may uh, contribute to the shaping as a shaping factors of technology po politics of uh, particular publishing and particular as I have said military plant for example or not military plant but private military company manufacturer and so on and we cannot speak of such things as the politics of Secondhand clothes, flea markets, or online stores, because online stores are means of technopolitics. They are encrusted into them, but they are not separately exist as, as uh, technopolitical agents. They are only a chain in a link of uh, exercising power over things. But they are not the thing in a nutshell which can uh, be attributed to be the subject an independent subject of technopolitics, only its component element. The same is about the delivery, which also comes as means of exercising power over things by their producer, but not as an independent entity. Again, the same is for streaming services, which can only be linked to uh, a certain agent who either chooses or not chooses uh, streaming service as a means of distribution. The same we cannot speak of technopolitics of art because arts is uh, contrary to these things. Arts, art is more abstract and more general thing which dominates over technopolitics. In this case, technopolitics is integrated into art as a form of social production, as an instance of social production. So it's uh, wider than it. And in this case, which have been highlighted yellow, it's uh narrower than technopolitics the same is about fashion so arts and fashion cannot be included here so we can see that there is a list of human activities which are not a subject because of their either anarchistic nature or they are too uh, narrow by default or they defy uh, deny and defy the postulates of what is referred to as technopolitics for example uh my instance just when you buy a leather jacket at second hand, you are not uh, directly contributing into the development of the technopolitics of uh, leather clothes production, non-ethical, because you're buying it second hand. So uh, second hand annuls or eliminates the attitude, the relation of the user of leather jacket or buyer of leather jacket to the leather clothes production. So you can wear leather uh, clothes or fur clothes, but not contribute directly into the uh, development of uh, clothing industry, which is non-ethical from a vegan point of view, for example. That is why I have taken this example just to uh, speak about it a little bit. So as history shows us, even in our contemporary era of accelerated technocapitalism, let's, let's call it this way, such components, all these components which have been discussed are far from being unitary and homogeneous and they vary greatly from different organization assemblage uh, agent in short. So for example, some companies, some agents of technopolitics still rely on manu and plastic manufacturing, which we'll discuss in detail uh, in the following slides. So in other cases, for example, we have that the workers of the company are themselves shareholders of the company's assets, which which affects directly their own interest in quality, quantity, production, and in uh, corporational decisions towards the scopes, volumes, markets, and so on. And uh, how many things to produce, what type of things to produce, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, shaped, uh, it may be shaped by just the fact of owning uh, the assets of company. The same is with means of production. Either, either they uh, take them uh, as a rent, as a tenant, or they own them or they produce them directly or do they need or don't uh, the third party engineers to uh, to repair the equipment to create it or they have all their own um, unit which is responsible for the reparation creation and engineer and construction bureau and invention bureau innovation bureau so uh, uh, the other um, <clears throat> differences and contingencies such as we have the head the construction as i have said bureau or innovation bureau as uh, on the assembly where is not merely a uh, chief executive officer the businessman but a person which is not only bureaucrat but a genius a polymath an inventioner uh, himself or herself while we also can have the body and hands of 
the production, uh, which only receives the orders from this head, be it businessman or inventor, uh, without any other permissions for you know for improvising or improving or changing the conditions in terms only reproduction, replication, you might say. In some other cases, the company has or has not its own SNR facility and laboratory, while the other may just buy patients from the other inventors or by permissions to use the this particular technology without the need to have uh, a SNR unit on the regular basis. So they just need some one technology. So, uh, the other may uh, um, benefit from a single scientific discovery, which have been transited in one way or another to capitalist market as a product, as a commodity, as a means uh, of ex exchange, as an element of exchange. Mm. And in some other cases, it may not be related to scientific activity at all, being a result just of a successful invention uh, by, you know, by from autodidact and genius in polymers to half educated mediocre as it has been with scientific discoveries of Faraday uh, because uh, the historians of physics uh, they say that Faraday was a rather mediocre scientist he just could uh, he just managed to put some things and discoveries together to make his own uh, scientific discoveries so the discoveries have been made prior to him and he just integrated them as a set uh, to make his own discovery. So it's a rather contingent uh, thing of turning the inventions and discoveries and scientific breakthroughs into commodity and the way how this commodity is handled by the agents of technopolities. So uh, speaking about the dimensions, I put them as two axes, so functional and organizational one and material and compositional. But what I like to say that we shouldn't view them as, you know, as two X graph, despite I have called this axis. Rather, what is interesting here is that they are the function more like Venn's diagrams. And their intersection is actually what constitutes and conditionalizes what we can call technopolitical continuum. And we will discuss technopolitical continuum in these two axes. I just call them axes because it's more, um, I feel it's more correct, yet it's not uh, the most illustrative way of speaking of the subject. So just to clarify what we mean here by these two axes, we say that the first one would deal would deal with the production and producers, the assemblages, the hybrids, networks. So what we may call, referring to Foucault again, the order of things, the way things are ordered. While this second axis deals with the nature of things, of their material composition, of material to be chosen, of from what, in what way should they be created. As we will see, Actually, this axis is rather limited because it can be, uh, in a nutshell, it can be reduced to two fundamental categories of analog and digital object, digital and analog thing. But we'll speak about this broadly a bit later. Then uh, my methodology in briefly, so I will try to move from the universal, which we already have. So universal was this definition, general definition of technopolitics as exercising power over things. Then we will come right away in this next slide to the particulars, to particular instances. Then we will use classical Marxist method of coming from the concrete to the abstract. It's reverse Hegelian, as far as you can remember. Hegel in his science of logic starts from the most abstract categories, being nothing. Then he fills them with more concrete. So it's movement from abstract to concrete. I choose Marx's way of moving from concrete to abstract, but before we'll briefly discuss particulars. Then I also use would use on this stage of concrete, I would use a synchronic, synchronistic 
uh, method of comparison taken from linguistics. Uh, linguistic synchrony is when you take uh, three or any amount, of, for example, of languages in the particular moment of coexistence, not in their historical development, but just in their coexistence, and compare them in this contemporary, for example, or other stage of their coexistence on temporal scale. So the same I will do on this concrete stage with three instances of music industry uh, with regards to technopolitics of these three uh, agents of music industry, not as a players on capitalist market, but as a technopolitical agents. And then we will have a small uh, um, interlude into anti uh, genealogical uh, mm, analysis, because I intend to show that actually the history of the technopolitical agent doesn't affect it. Uh, so it uh, cannot, you know, cannot produce a decisive effect on it. Okay. So the instances list. For example, when the company produces, it's just instances of what I call technopolitical configurations, how these units are organized and how all the things which have been discussed, uh, discussed abstractly are uh, emanated, instantiated in some hypothetical or uh, real particulars. So the company produces its own musical instruments without relying on outer sources and intelligence team. Uh, so the, produ the production of capacities and powers are situated at one and the same place. So they are not, for example, in different countries in China or something like that, we'll see. So the staff of companies situated in one set of facilities without the delegation of any potential function, role, uh, pro need of product, supporting product um, outside of the singular location. The other potential instance is, for example, when a uh, company creates its all products uh, transition the productive process to the third party manufacturer. It only creates uh, paradigmatic samples or inventions or, or uh, PCBs, printed circuit board, which uh, so they just create the paradigm, paradigm and they delegate the replication of this paradigmatic example to the third party. Or as we can see, case examples. So the production would be made by some replicator. Then uh, the other instance of technopolitical configuration, for example, is um, when movie comes to certain designation, designated distribution means. Would it be released in cinema or not? Would it be released on DVD or directly to video instead of cinema? VHS, downloading for purchase, and so on, where the company itself is both client, client of the distribution services and uh, manufacturing services, and the head of the whole assemblage of the movie distribution. So we, as you can see, we do not deal with the uh, director of the movie, with plot of the movie. From technopolitical point of view, it means nothing. It it's a problem of art itself or other aspects of creation of piece of art of movie. So the instance of technopolitics in this case is just a distribution and the way uh, the cultural product, which is ossified, reified, becomes uh, commodified. So the way it comes into the exchange of the market of uh, ossified pieces of art, such as movie. So any kind of distribution would involve certain technical means, which would call for certain agendas and political decisions and choices which the company should make. Then uh, the simple example with the record label, which has its own means of creation uh, of recordings and their manufacturing distribution. For example, uh, nowadays, the less uh, labels, especially independent labels, are eligible, uh, are Important to create vinyls themselves, vinyl, uh, not just you know making a pack for it, but means of creation the uh, vinyl as uh, or an object which can be then um, listened and so on and so forth. So uh, again, it depends of 
the existing modes of customers experimental leaders so one label may choose only digital only distribution and then to exist it introduces paid or free content for promotion so on uh, on the corresponding platforms again the choice of platform in this case is decisive for the distribution of the content uh, which is the direct duty and obligation and the purpose of existing of a digital label. The other would choose more hardware forms of distribution. The third one would um, choose both. So these would require five different approaches and means of distribution and production, because again, in this case, should pay for digital to digital platform for a premium account for example and so on and so forth and things, uh, for placing the content or you face the limitations or if you want to use free only services um, there will be part another talk so to say then uh, when we speak about digital promotion digital distribution we should have or have not the special smm or co unit for the distribution while the hardware distribution would uh require far another problems and another technopolitical decision just what i wanted to say about that the same is with independent book publishing and its choice uh and publishing policies which are regarded to copyright to political issues to epistemic and social aspects of what for example is eligible to be published for example uh james graham ballard's book um uh piece from this book uh which was called why i want to uh, ronald reagan was uh abandoned from the bookstores uh withdrawn from the bookstores when it had been published firstly but now we know that uh, trust exhibition well, this book is a uh, classic so with regards to here we have the domination again of political social aspects and issues over over the uh technopolitical decisions, so they are shaping it. So uh, in this case, we deal with what is to be produced, how will it be produced, and means of distribution. For example, when we have punk DIY zine, we may write there everything and distribute it in a free way uh, without problems with, uh, you know, with morals or some social mm, convictions and condemnations or so campaigns against the book. Again, the newspaper Daily News tried to make a social campaign against Bauer's book. But this not non-technopolitical decision have affected badly the technopolitical issues concerning the publisher of the book. Mm. Here we have business of military company with its own commitments, obligations, and duties with regards to international national politics. Uh, so the first is, for example, national permission of distribution of the technologies to the other countries. Then the conditions of sale, which are set if we have a the permission, we should uh, the company may define its own conditions of um, sell selling their products. The relation of intellectual property to the armed forces of the state. How which rights? has the state uh, on using, owning, uh, or purchasing, or ordering uh, the production, and the possibility of making contracts within and without, out of the country with foreign partners. And it depends on the state of the relation between these two countries, where, it's, for example, if it's obvious when two countries are at war, uh, the company which belongs to company A, which is at war, is company B, is not eligible to sell its technologies to B. It would be banned by the national law, by martial law of the country, I suppose. The same uh, is, for example, with example with uh, Bayraktar, Turkish drones, which are sold now to Ukraine. The, Haluk Barak, uh, the head of the company, Haluk Baraktar, has said that he, under no conditions, even if all 
the permissions would be received, would not sell his technologies to Russia just by principle, not because of the money, because of national politics. It's just his decision to ban the sale because he uh, supports Ukraine. That's an instance when uh, personal political issues are intertwined, intersected with technopolitics affecting it, but they still should be separated from technopolitical aspects of uh, Bayraktar company. The other uh, instance is when we have some company which produces software for another company's hardware, and they reciprocally, uh, reci I'm sorry, reciprocally incapable of doing the opposite. So company two cannot produce software, company one, the hardware. So this interdependence, this reciprocal implication, as Marx would put it, uh, is, alliance, is aligned with each other's intention of profit making of these positions of, uh, so you see, uh, market segment embedding, so with market politics. And this market politics, it is itself aligned with a technopolitical means of production of uh, technopolitical technopolitics as means of them of being the agents of the market, the agents of exchange and commodification. They may have different reasons for that. And my, mm, my favorite example as a chain smoker. Mm, so we have now the uh, competition between British American Tobacco and um, Philip Morris in uh, this um, non Mm, not electronic cigarettes, but you know, ICOS and GLO. So, uh, for example, GLO mm, or NEO, they have their own big uh, research facility, which uh, on the on a regular basis publish the result of scientific explorations. So they have a scientific unit, which works for them instantly. Not a one-time uh, scientific research, not a freelance scientific collective which has been hired for particularly one, um, one research, one exploration. They have a staff of scientists who continuously, instantly are working on that. The same is for ICOS, uh, despite they are not publishing their results, uh, not because it's a deal of secret, just they are not doing this. They perhaps they do not have uh, the persons which are good at writing and publishing the results. However, they both have the robots, the laboratories, uh, the conducted ex uh, applied explorations. So it's a clear instance that they uh, may have made some particular technopolitical commitments, particular technopolitical decisions, because Actually, they couldn't have keep their scientific collective on a regular basis. They just could have used part, uh, some laboratories for uh, from the third party for one time exploration or exploration one in a year or one in a half of a year and so on and so forth. So uh, they just have chosen to make this uh, organ for their body without organ of the corporation. Okay, now for the concrete part before we would come to the abstract heights, uh, three paradigms of technopolitics on the basis of music industry. I have chosen three manufacturer, uh, American company MOOC, uh, Japanese company Roland, and international, actually basically German, but now Filipinian and Filipinian slash Chinese company Behringer. So uh, technopolitics of MOOC which are, what are its features? Firstly, it should be said that, as I have uh, put it in previous instances, it's largely employee owned. So 62 of the employees of the company own the 49% of the company shares and assets. Uh, they are more like, you know, like a classical American mythical figure of capitalism, of early capitalism. It's still almost manufacturing, manufacture. So it's mm, partially manual labor, but, but they own decision because they are directly interested in the, in the product. So they are uh, 
created on the uh, we own facility in Asheville. So roughly speaking, they design and make things in one and the same place, one and the same locus. They create analog musical instruments with some digital exceptions uh, and are manufacturing the firmware for it. We'll deal with the notion of firmware later. Mm. If someone doesn't know it, I would define it briefly. So the way of production is closer to this pre-capitalistic manufacturing. They have limited amount of manually assembled and soldered products. I mean, PCB is analog. Analog PCB, analog printed circuit boards, is when the signal which is created goes through the uh, real how do we say microprocessors or devices such as oscillator, filter, amplifier. It's basic, uh, I mean, basic uh, scheme for the musical uh, instruments such as synthesizer on which MOOC are specialized with some exceptions of creating the musical effect pedals also. So there is no possibility of you know mass marketing. You cannot put it in each uh, musical store of Europe, of Europe as you know, as just artists with thousands and hundreds of thousands of the devices. It's rather limited. So that is why we have a higher price of production because of the components and the way they are created and smaller, lesser tempo of the production due to these all features. Uh, then we, they have virtual instruments pro, uh, production, so virtual synthesizers, which can be downloadable for money from App Store, or from uh, I don't know if it is downloadable for Android. I don't Apple user. Uh, so uh, it's also integrated into MOOC preparation edges. No third party engineers engineers are you know invited to design some virtual product. It's all in the company. And they are also rather user oriented and responsive to particular demands and proposals from the users. Uh, and they also create limited edition of things for extra small pools of customers on uh, their own events of communication with users, such as MOOC Festival, where they uh, invite musicians to play and they do the important, because musical concert is not a technopolitical event. What is technopolitical event is a workshop. I will speak about this in a moment. So, generally speaking, we have here that live death decisions concerning things, which things to produce, which things to uh, is to modify, which is to be renewed by firmware or updated, which is not, which would be ceased to produce and become a legacy product. So it just uh, all happens at the same place. Then the inventors and manufacturers, so the head, is inseparable from the body, from the hands or body. Uh, then the communications with users again made not by you know by some PR department, it just made by the same token. So no third party, as I have said, is involved into firmware uh, device creation. And yes, when we have a producer user technopolitical communication, not just another type of communication, social uh, marketing communication. We have a workshop as a medium of communication. When, uh, for example, the in, in case with MOOC, the manufacturer uh, holds an event where they show how to solder your own synthesizer from the basic kit of reassembled synth. So we can see that workshops also can be of two types for anyone and for the prepared user. Because, well, when you come and buy this DIY assembling synthesizer kit and you cannot solder, you have just no skills. <laughs> when you will try to do this without any preparations and knowledge on this event of communication, you're only one to blame for failure, for failure and spending out money into the dust and doing nothing and just breaking uh, the set of things because just because you didn't have uh, skills and knowledge enough to do what the producer proposes to you to be a subject of a small subject of technology to give a birth for, to your own you know child thing 
uh, it's a metaphor. So uh, I think you got it that on some workshops, everyone can do this. In some cases, for some workshops, uh, only those with necessary knowledge are uh, potent to do this. But this all uh, still is still a, as I said, workshop, is still a form of communication of technopolitical nature. <clears throat> then the second company, Roland. So its uh, technopolitics varies greatly because it has a mass market production operating worldwide. It has a wide range scope of categories, not just synthesizers, stuff like that, everything from mixtures to, to software um, or virtual analog technologies or uh, virtual instruments, as well as analog instruments, as well as hardware uh, um, musical instruments of different nature and not only instruments, but the equipment as well. They are rather non-user oriented. They do not communicate with users and do not do not listen a lot to what they uh, propose, and they have more like commercial um, commodities more oriented into the so so the tech politics is more tied or aligned with market politics and. Price for that is that they ignore user proposals and demands and offers orienting more like on the problems of market competition with other subjects of technopolitics and production and uh, uh, selling musical gear. So they also have been successful in produ production of some legacy products, which have been analog devices. But now their technopolitics is relying heavily on their own history and reputation instead of inventiveness. They do not create new technologies, not, not uh, buy patents. They just make a, a lot of digital copies, digital replicas of their own devices from the past, which have become legendary without analog recreation of them, uh, without analog continuation of these so-called legacy products. So they, yes, prefer digital replica reissues of their own products, which have been discontinued. And as the CEO has said, they just do not have such uh, amount of production capacities to place it, um, uh, put in orders for creation of digital, oh, I'm sorry, analog um, products. That is why they heavily rely on digital replication of the analog, analog products. They also have rather middle term support for the updating their firmware of their devices, which, uh, make it, which makes even digital devices obsolete in temporal sense. And they also have, in comparison with other technological agents, small amount of uh, you know, promotional content, which would um, make, which would turn users to, uh, use more frequently their own devices because they do not propose much user-friendly you know, promotional content. Then finally, the third um, instance of technopolitics, Behringer or B technopolitics. So they are known for doing quite opposite. They take the legendary and discontinued old analog devices of the other uh, firms and make actually cheap and high quality analog, not digital copies of these devices. Because the operator Uli Berenger is a highly skilled uh, genius and polymath in creation of music gear. Uh, and he literally, not just a CEO, but he personally is involved in the development of these replica, replica, replicas of analog devices of the past. But that's not only their uh, decisive feature, it's just a very uh, you know, specific trait. But also we should mention that they have a strong mind body rupture because they have their headquarters in Germany. The company registered in Philippines but all the manufacturing facilities are situated in China. We'll uh, deal with this aspect in a wider sense. 
So because of the latter, because of this hands, head, uh, heart being thrown out throughout the world, uh, it is capable of annual production, of production of analog devices, of which, for example, uh, Roland are enabled on a mass market scale. So yes, uh, in this case, not like in MOOC, in the first case, which is incapable of mass market production of the same analog devices. This case is capable of mass market just as Roland as our, our technologies, but making the devices as the agent of M technologies, analog devices on mass market. So they incorporate two features of the previously discussed. They are also very open to users uh, and user rate for well, their support um, lacks um, efficiency, but this would be discussed a little bit later. So um, how this thing have come to this mind body rupture? At the beginning, the most parts of the components have been actually produced where the head was uh, at in Germany, yes. With only a few elements and components which have been to, uh, to be produced as cheaper in China for the sake, as Uli Beringer has said, for the sake of the cheapness, relative cheapness of the products. Because his goals, his intentions uh, towards mass market were, uh, as you can see, make the products which are affordable for wide audience, for home studios, independent musicians, and so on and so forth. But in 2002, the company has eventually constructed a huge agglomeration of their plant in China, which bear this name, Behringer City. Yes. After this is the decision to switch the whole, not partial production of Behringer to China. So this technopolitical decision has led to su such a social phenomena as Behringer City, the city of workers who work for solely for Behringer production. So currently they are operating, as you can see, on one hand, so countries with uh, this amount of employees all over the world. At the same time, we know that the production of this is condensed in China and things are born there. So the, and the decision and the design inventions are made elsewhere uh, in Germany in particular. Okay. Now, uh, this was this all was the discussion of functional and organizational axis. Now, for the material comp compositional axis, uh, I won't say much about that, but I should just speak about that, uh, not only with regards to music industry, but in general. Maybe it would sound very opinionated or uh, I don't know pretentious, but it's still my point of view, strong point of view that. With regards to the question of the nature of things, we can speak about when we reduce everything. We can speak about only two kinds of things in technopolitical dimension, analog and digital in different forms. As you see, hardware or hard anything, hard copy, hard cover, digipack, uh, equipment and physical machine, actual machine or physical, uh, again, physical uh, tractors of audio, physical way, path of signal, analog television. So analog and digital in manifold instances. So software for the hardware, virtual machines, which emulate the work of analog. When you have, for example, virtual analog uh, synthesizer, it operates in digital realm with digital technology, but it emulates, simulates for you, for user, it simulates the analog tract. So when you put a knob, uh, tweak, tweak, a knob of a digital synthesizer, it emulates as if it you have been doing uh, this operation with uh, analog synthesizer, with knob dedicated to each function, with uh, PCB um, soldered, uh, by the principle of work of hardware and so on. So the same is for emulation with, for example, digital TV, which emulates uh, the analog tract. The application, which is separate from software, because you can have, uh, you know, soft uh, application without uh, dedicated hardware, some digitalized copy of the device or firmware, 
Now I would define for those who doesn't know what is firm. Firm is a sort of program uh, equipment or uh, operating system for a dedicated hardware or digital device. For example, this is a digital sampler, electron digital. It's written like, uh, it was digital drum computer and sample. So its principles of work are digital actually. Yet it has hardware outputs, for example. So it, and itself, as you can see, it's pretty hardware, it's metal start case. So, but to operate properly, it needs its own operational system, which is called Digitac to S, digital operational or Digitac operational system, because it doesn't work on Windows, uh, iOS, PadOS, uh, Android, whatever you call it, on basic operation system. It needs separate operational system as a certain device. So this is firmware. It needs uh, when you have a device like this, you need a technopolitical dedication or commitment to updating the firmware with regards to both general paradigm of operating operating systems with which each can be integrated or musical software with regards to musical software integration it's even threefold and with regards to creation of new functions for the device itself new digital functions if you have such a device but we also have a separate subclass of the firmware which is dedicated uh, to um, the uh, analog devices okay now we would speak about the distinction of analog and digital in the context of this uh, axis discussion. So uh, the problem is with diachronic and historic time. Analog devices are never out of date until the moment they are usable at all. So for example, uh, if you have undestructed a cork um, or I know MOOC synthesizer of 70s, you can actually use it without a problem of compatibility because analog track doesn't need re renewal. And digital devices in this case, in this sense, are not in this uh, preferable position because they become incompatible with the other digital equipment. They become incommensurable uh, with regards to the development of technologies such as basic like MIDI technology, USB or digital uh, audio workstations. So re the recording software for the computers. Uh, so it's just like instances, but we can extrapolate this. I think it won't be the extrapolation of bias if we'll extrapolate this to all digital devices. They all need instance, instant updates with global or uh, local concrete particular sense. So with regards to global development of the digital or virtual reality world and particular sphere to which this digital device is dedicated. So uh, they need constant revision or they will become obsolete and gradually they will become unusable at some point. So yes. Or there is a way to save this device from solution, even if technopolitical decision have been uh, taken for their um, suspension, the death or cancellation. We have sometimes third party enthusiasts, which can, for example, uh, develop the hardware to make the legacy products, which are useless, compatible with contemporary paradigms. But when we speak about the enthusiasts, we do not speak about technopolitics. It's the same as the second-hand leather jacket uh, for vegan. But when company, one company, company, for example, Cork, decides to create a replica based on the history of Yamaha DX7, DX7 synthesizer, creating Volca FM synthesizer, they are just not just playing with legacy. They are uh, make a technopolitical decision to recreate what has become an obsolete in history and incompatible, too incompatible for the contemporary world. Make it compatible. <laughs> then we say that the analog devices are independent of the condition, are dependent, I'm sorry, on the conditions of their explorations 
uh, exploitation, the delivery, uh, storage, and conservation. So when you ship a party of analog devices in uh, bad conditions, in you know, on huge uh, on low temper uh, temperatures with huge humidity, this may affect the analog tract, especially if we speak about the analog synthesizer synthesizers, and they will sound differently. So the uh, synthesizer one, which has been no. Literally speaking, would sound differently from synthesizer two, which have been shipped with this temperature. Generally speaking, it may not affect, but it may affect. And each uh, of this, each element of the disjunction may affect it badly or not. Then uh, it's just general consideration. So as we have said, digital devices are electronically vulnerable, but they are not so much dependent as analog devices from this parametric condition. It's obvious because in virtual form or in form of emulation, this may not be the decisive factor, the decisive problem. So we cannot exclude technopolitics from the way in which both kinds of devices are produced and distributed distributed and they yes may become obsolete for user and from the user's viewpoint when when the device is usable but the user says i don't want to use it it's too obsolete so digital device may become obsolete because of the incommensurability with the digital environment from the diagramic historical viewpoint and digital from scratch product is better received by users than digital as copy. For example, when Roland says, oh, we recreated our analog successful device with the most precise level possible conditions of recreation, but they use this word and principle recreation. They recreate something from the legacy. So, and people think like analog was better in, in no way digital copy is compatible with or uh, comparable to the previous product while we say the digital from scratch when well, you're not intended to you know to use your own history or someone's history but you say yes it's a digital device and it's it does what it does just it's so it's the purpose for which it was created for example uh, so it's better received we may say from the uh, point of view of technological communication with the uh, user. So yes, we may say that technopolitics of these three paradigms, uh, Mugroland and Berenger, are not reduced to uh, all the technopolitical issues are not reduced to them. So these are only possible configurations which are different from those. Then as an appendix to this part of concreteness, uh, how these paradigms may be changed, may result in some new brand, brand new technopolitics of things. We'll discuss the manufacture of this device, Electron, because they are unlike any of three, but uh, they have also unique traits and they also have a traits similar to, uh, by some features to the discussed subject. So for example, they are integration oriented oriented, aligned with the gear music of the time and friendly to other manufacturers, so to say. They are collaborative with professional musicians. So they oriented uh, are oriented on the needs of musicians who also help and collaborate. So this, this, this is the case when I have said about inviting the person to do something like a research collective for tobacco company, but uh, they do invite the collaborators not just as you know third parties, but uh, they help them not only to promote, not only in market, um, not only for market purposes, but these musicians help them to create actual content of the company. For example, as sample collections, uh, which are then sold uh, by company on its website. So the musicians not are just users; they are here a partici uh, the participators. 
of content creation of some segment of creation of the content uh, surely for some benefits which they receive from the company itself they also heavily rely on their own patented technologies which and innovations which cannot be copied uh, and recreated and until today there are some but we don't have time to discuss them in details uh, then they are also relatively young. They do not have such a wide history as those three companies. Uh, the youngest of those was Berger in uh, 1988, and Mook and uh, well Roland are back in the 70s or even earlier in the case of Mook. This is a relatively young company, so they do not have you know some notorious persons, but that do not affect in any way uh, their product. Then anti-genealogical part. For example, we, we may speak of three personalities, just discussing briefly. So uh, who was Robert Mook, the founder of M Technology the company? As a child, he worked um, with a father who was the engineer. In 14 years, he had built his own theremin. Then he has got physical uh, education in engineering, physics, and electronic engineering. So he was act actively published. And then uh, when you see, when we had a technological breakthrough, it affected technopolitics of company because then MOOC, being a scientist, a PhD in, uh, in engineering physics at that time, invented patients, uh, voltage controlled oscillator, voltage controlled amplifier, and voltage controlled filter, which allowed him to create his first synthesizer. So he's a scientist and inventor. And we, what is interesting in this personality, he described himself as only a tool maker as a designer of things for users, but not as a person directly involved in music, not for himself. Roland were founded by Iftaro Kakehashi, Kakehashi uh, who had no musical training or formal education. He prepared radios to make for, earn for a living. Then uh, he discussed, uh, designed his first monophonic organ. So he firstly intended to focus on uh, amateurs, enthusiasts, hobbyists, and on the affordability of, as you see. And he, for this purpose, he didn't invent anything like Robert Moog. He uh, relied on the existing renowned uh, technologies of his time, but he occasionally played some role in uh, development of most basic technologies of his time media. For another case is about the if, uh, Kakehashi didn't receive any musical education. As you can see, Uli Berenger was a son of church organist and pianist, nephew. Uh, I mean, uh, this was his mother, this was his father, nephew of uncle, music, a musical theorist, and aunt, musical or oh, classical singer and pianist. So, since four years, he already knew how to play piano. And then he at the age of five, helped his father to build at a house, 105 organ. At the age of 16, as you see, he created his first synthesizer. Then he, uh, his uncle worked in this Robert Schumann Conservatory. So he started piano and sound engineering as uh, uh, and the, the result was that he created not just synthesizer, but uh, a complicated thing such as digital reverb, which have been new noted for those days, and this legacy product is used even nowadays. So he personally supervises and constructs, uh, constructs all the products and schematics and co-works with other inventors and engineers. So he sees himself not as a tool maker, as Robert Moog, but as an enthusiast, person personally engaged. A lesson which we can learn from these biographies is actually that they do not affect technopolitics. The technopolitics with regards to companies, so it, uh, the personality actually doesn't define the development of technopolitics as the assemblage. So it may or not, it may be or maybe not aligned occasionally with some personal traits. Now for the concluding part, the general features of technopolitics as derived from these concrete studies um, and uh, considerations and comparisons, uh, general features. So 
first one is the technopolitics as a form of exercising and manifesting the power of things by structure is has, it has modular structure uh, in technical and um, partially in mathematical sense. So it consists of several autonomous blocks which can be interchanged, exchanged without the dissipation of the whole structure. So it's like uh, when you have a signal, you know, oscillator with waveforms like so or sinusoids, sinusoid. Uh, and for example, you have voltage controlled filter, which filters the frequency, uh, the frequencies pleasant or unpleasant. If you have two different and you have again in n configurations whatever um filter you choose whatever amplifier you choose whatever waveform you choose if you just change them the whole structure won't dissipate it dissipates only if we dis uh, eliminate the element of chain so when we say that this is a chain of modular structure we just say that each on each stage it can be changed by other uh, independent, uh, in, partially independent entity. I mean, independently existing entity. So filter one, filter two, amplifier three, amplifier 10. So unless, uh, until you have all the components of the chain uh, in, you have no disintegration. But modularity means the possibility of changing uh, of each of elements because each of elements is responsible for one only purpose one only function which it does uh, separately from the other components of which some uh, complex entity is compound then we have said it that a personality founder doesn't shape technopolitics so uh, he or she can only define some of vectors of company traits and features but only to some limited end, but not even penultimate ends. And it's precisely because what composes these modules of technopolitics are of different vectors, intentions, contingencies, power plays, conflicts, fractures inside the agent or network, and so on. <clears throat> so, my only quotation of, of, for this lecture is Gautari's quotation. Uh, so we say that because of the letter, this, the particular identity of a person is raised, subsumed by corpo of corporation. And ultimately, technopolitics takes, uh, should be taken. So agent of technopolitics, it's subject of enunciation, or uh, it is also translated from French as subject of articulation. It's just precisely what Guattari says that uh, subject of enunciation can be impersonal and de-individuated. So yes, the spoke person individual is not as a subject of enunciation, meaning that we should distinguish between spoke person individuals, such as, for example, uh, founder of the company or its CEO, like Mook uh, or Katehashi or Uli Beringer. It's not the same as a subject of enunciation with the case of technopolitics. So these two should be detached from one another. Then back to the modules. These modules are essentially and functionally both essentialist and functionalist assemblages, or in, in terms of actual network theory of Bruno Latour, hybrids as a, the intersection of or combinations of the agents of things of auxiliary scenes, uh, of transmitters, transporters of the actions, uh, networks, sets of actions, schedules. So for example, we have module one instance, human as worker plus machine plus product network, like network hybrid in uh, Laturian sense. Module two instance, automized production by machine without the worker product and human as supervising engineer over the automized production. So the one who repairs machine in case it stops or breaks or modifies it. So human as engineer as constructor, it can be the case too. Or module uh, three, which is the inclusive disjunction of both plus the disjunction of human as supervisor over the production, not engineer, but supervisor. Uh, 
uh, or machine as supervisor, automated, automated control of the quality of the products and so on and so forth. So we say modules because each of these modules do not embrace in its fullness and totality, which uh, what, what was called birth like this equation of things. So we shouldn't see, oh, it's not a feature. We shouldn't see technopolitics in any sense as ends, aims, and objectives. It's, oh, it, it's always means strategies odds. So we cannot ask in technopolitics, who doesn't ask a question, we don't ask a question to what end? We ask a question by what means? So ends, for example, the example, we need to reduce spendings on X. What can be put at odds for this game? Some thoughts and some says we can, uh, some of, you know, on business meetings says, we can close the sections as one and as four. And this closure, closing of the section, is the political decision, but the question is not itself. So means is a technopolitical decision, ends is something uh, far beyond it, or only partially intersection intersecting with ends. So in Foucauldian sense, let us again pin down these two metaphor of life and death, as biopolitics is, with regards to what can be called life and death of things in a nutshell. So for life, we have, for example, the decisions to create, to produce thing, which is not the same. Decision to design and manufacture this sample and to produce it serially or limitedly. Then to modify the same thing which has already been created, to copy it from the already existing, be it plagiarizing or by, by copyright. Just instances. Uh, these instances are only partially uh, in the scope of technopolitics and to continue the production of what it have been already uh, produced. So uh, metaphorically speaking, but we shouldn't overestimate the cognitive, you know, cognitive value of this metaphor. However, uh, we may think that this corresponds to uh, birth procreation, replication, mutations, mm -hmm, cloning and breeding uh, as actual or speculative aspects of biopolitics. As for the deaths, we have such things and decision of uh, stopping and suspending the, the production, not a putting thing in the production after the prototype was, for example, uh, proposed. We have prototype, we say, oh no, it's bad. It, it won't succeed. We won't produce it after, after the presentation of prototype. So it's also the decision the, um, aligned with Deaths of things, actually, even unborn. It's like an abortion of things uh, in, so, in some sense. Then withdrawal or, or the right to produce, making it um, uh, impossible in the continuum of law to produce things. Then uh, cancel, canceling of particular products. So we have three tanks of different modification of one model, we decide to leave one and the other are now to be abandoned. Prohibition uh, of the distribution of things, again, from copyright issues or something like that, or uh, selling of the company's productive capacity to the owner who decides uh, something like withdrawal, or canceling or reselling or mm, disassembling uh, the production capacities for other purposes, incorporating them into its own body without organs. I mean, as a technopolitical agent as a body without organs. Um, so yes, here the metaphors correspond to such things as elimination, birth control, abolition of procreation, selection of first individual, forced coupling <laughs> of parents or prenatal di diagnostics and so on. Additionally, we should stress on the particularity of the nature of the events as a subject. So if a technopolitical events are not any event related to the market, the mass market. So for example, we cannot say that there is technopolitical user-user communication, no technopolitical user-distributor communication, as well as user expert, user production unit, distributor production unit, researcher, user, or researcher distributor, or which is important, producer one, producer two, communicational acts. So these events, the 
really happen, but they are not a subject of technopolitics. What is a subject of technopolitics? Such communicational acts that uh, as user producer, in a sense, not a production union, but as, for example, as a workshop, as I have said, producer, producer inside the company, the same, the same uh, values are the organs, which is not the same as this. This is not a mistyping. So here we have producer one, company one, values are organs one, and two. They may have business communication, market communication. So everything that, uh, that holds for the notion of com uh, capitalist competition, uh, you know, like spheres of influence, uh, sharing of market, di market division of markets. If the company have achieved, uh, company two companies have achieved some agreement, and here, here producer producer communication means like uh, business meeting. CO meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, also, the same is with producer and distributor when uh, the producer is a client of distributor. It's the same as for producer and researcher when uh, the producer is a client of a researcher unit or it has some communication. So we see that there is a set of events which are can, uh, can be called um, technopolitical communicational acts but not any event which is related to birth and death of things or their circulation or, or their uh, commodity um, commodification or their exchange as a capitalist commodity. So for example, we have workshop business meeting inside the structure, as I have said, negotiations with third party, such as research or distributor, or between the detached agents, units and departments, pretty limited. Okay, uh, then we have just a small example and attributes. So, there is a lot of external factors which affect badly the, uh, or not badly, to the political decisions and actions. Uh, so, the capitalist competition, again, it's detached from technopolitics, but it affects the technopolitics. Then we have users as shaping factors. For example, uh, I would fasten a bit. So, uh, for example, we say that why some bands of noise and industrial, like so, the gristle, psychic TV, coil, tension, ring, yellow, craftwork, or such composers as Van Gelis and John Carpenter were so much ahead of their time. This is precisely because they used the technical advances which have been given by. Uh, by the uh, technical devices, musical devices of the time, um, which have been just all, uh, invented or patented in lab uh, and so on and so forth. So user fact, use factor may, may not be uh, decisive. So, uh, and there are also user as a shaping, uh, shaping factor. So just we may see that such thing as price, distribution, uh, availability. Mm. For example, distribution is yes, uh, just my personal example, which hurt, uh, hurt it so much. I wanted to buy Negrostani's Chronosis in digital kind, kind of version, but there is no kind of version of digital, uh, any other digital means of Chronosis of Negrostani, only hot cover, which is problematic to for me to order it to Madeira. Or the all, one of the technical shaping factors is how they organize their customer's service. Because for example, in case of Behringer, if you have your synthesizer broken and uh, they say, okay, we'll look if it is the guarantee case and would we mm, repay it for free, but you should send it to the United Kingdom or to Germany uh, to some, it just changed the location. So um, for us to see if it's eligible to the uh, free support. But when you send it from the other side of the world, it's a problem. And uh, this is only to diagnose if, uh, to make an analysis, if it's eligible to a uh, free repair or not. The other not uh, notable- sorry, um, sorry to interrupt very briefly. Uh, it, it would be good maybe to use the next five minutes to, 
to kind of wrap up if it's at all possible? Yes, I will. I have plans to do this. Yes, so uh, just some last slides. So uh, the other notable ex external impact factor, as you see, is uh, development of technical applied uh, sciences. So firstly, it may refer to the advantages which can be converted into market values or commodified and discoveries which are not related directly to the field of agent of technologies. For example, a mass breakthrough in fundamental physics as a means of uh, uh, creation of certain commodities like home facilities and so on and so forth. So yes, in, ca in case of the first advances, we have the factual implementation of directly related issues of the subject. And here we have indirect transition from potential to actual. And finally, closing remark. Uh, so uh, I find it important because uh, if we think about this again in universal sense, when we say that biopolitics up to date deals with quantitative aspects of exercising power over life and death, uh, because Foucault deals with the notion of population. And uh, Italian Marxist Paolo Virno, also uh, inspired by Foucault's notion of biopolitics, calls biopolitics the grammar of the multitude multitudes so yes because uh whatever you do you limit procreation as in china you uh, you put people in into high rises to live for example you uh abandon or uh, not abandon uh, the abortions in all these cases, you deal with quantitative qualities and with quantization of people. Because when we have high rise, you quantize people by putting them in high rise instead of, uh, you know, the detached houses. It's all about uh, quantity. Because uh, yes, if we would have had cloning, it would have been a kind of, uh, you know, a qualitative uh, movement. But there is no cloning up to date. Because that's why I have said up to date where politics is quantitative aspect of uh, exercising power, while technopolitics is both quantitative and qualitative aspect of exercising power or life and less of things instead of population, instead of population as a multitude or as an abstract composition or as a concrete particularization. So yes, when we can, uh, speak about the degrees of how, where uh, the absoluteness of power is exercised, technopolitics uh, prevails. Ooh, thanks you. Thank you for your attention. Thank I you so you much. Thank you. Thank, I can't thank you enough. This is a, a whole vocabulary in prison through which also to read Simon Don, for example, which is invaluable. It's just such a rich presentation and um, incredible. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lowe. Really. Um, also, you. also, you put so much work into presenting this. This is amazing. I, I hope that this is a blueprint for an article that you're putting together because this definitely, I think, is material that needs to be published. Um, if it was possible, it would be nice to have a discussion straight away. But because of the pressure, time pressure of this um, uh, two and a half hours that we have, I would suggest that we have a break. Um, what's the time now? I've got two clocks with two different times and I have to leave the app to see what time it really is. Um, it will just to give people a proper time to refresh their minds. Uh, perhaps if we give it 10 minutes, if, is that okay, everyone? We come back in 10 minutes and then I would say, if it's at all possible, aim for your presentation for 10 minutes and give yourself no more than 20 minutes. Then we should be able to do the presentations in one hour and hopefully have um, a very short time left after that, maybe 20 minutes to discuss and pull all the strings together and uh, come back uh, to some of the things in your presentation. It was beautiful, really. I can't thank you enough. Such a rich presentation. So yeah, if that if it's okay, we'll do a 10 minute break now. Everyone happy with that? Okay, in that case, see you back here in 10 minutes. Yes, you're back soon.
Okay. So let me see if everyone is coming back. Nice. Thank you. Okay, amazing. Thanks everyone for coming back. And again, Mrs. Lab, thank you so much. This was um, so much to think about. And I, I can't say I have often come across someone with such a you know, wealth of detailed knowledge plus the capacity to spec step back and have a kind of bigger speculative questions. This is such a, I think you are a very Simondonian thinker, not that you think like him, but that you have this capacity to be both right, like really detailed in your involvement and, and have a very audacious speculative look at it. This was such a, such a good talk. Thank you so much, I really. Anyway, so Enrique, can you perhaps moderate the presentations and um, and then we try and yeah, as I said, everyone aim perhaps at 10 minutes and try to stop yourselves at 20 minutes. That would be great. Um, I don't, I can't switch very well on my phone between my timer function and the Zoom function. So if someone could use a timer, that would be, or Enrique, maybe if you have a timer, that could be really amazing. Thank you very much. So let's go. Sure. Uh, Cecil, do you want me to go to the order in the list? Yes, if you could call people up for their presentations kind of in the, in the order that you have it there on the list, I think that's a good way to do it, unless you okay. have a better idea. Okay. Uh, so uh, the order I have is Nick, Ioannis, Denise, Ishta, and Anna. So Nick, if you're ready, you can start. I think Nick is not here right now. Uh, the next name is Ioannis. Okay, I'll start and I'll let's see if we can go on back. Okay. Thank um, you. So first, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Miss Love for the presentation and uh, for the texts. It, it also feels like having attended uh, Technique Beyond Monoculture, it feels really homely and it's so nice, so nice to see this other side of yours, you know, not only as a moderator, but, um, you know, giving us uh, so many resources. Um, so let me share the, the screen. Um, so, um, the text, oh, let me, okay. Um, the text that I decided to present is uh, Jane Whitehead's The Black Swan, Art in the Age of Post-Mechanical Reproduction. And uh, what I will try to do is uh, bring in some references that I find uh, useful to interact with the text and well, possibly provide some points to revisit in terms of what we've seen and uh, discussed so far. Um, the text was originally presented as part of the 20th Generative Art Conference in 2017, and as Whitehead suggests, it was also meant as a possible installation or performance. In this slide, the title has been superimposed upon Jane Whitehead or Jay Liat's 1997 single piece of electronic drone, interestingly called The Nature of Nature. Well, uh, to start, we could say Whitehead's text circulates around the idea of crisis, a historical crisis, the current crisis, a crisis of meaning, general and specific to contemporary philosophy and our theory, the crisis of the art galleries and auction houses, of technology, to name but a few, and possible ways of overcoming or responding to crises characterized by confusion and alienation. One of these ways of responding are histotemic objects or devices, somehow resembling or referring to the moment occurring in the wake of contact with more technologically advanced societies. The Swan device is a quote for Dr. Strange Love type devices from the 60s. The Swan device is an oblique reference to a possible resolution to a crisis in the arts within the early 21st century which takes the form not of a mad scenario that is mutually assured destruction, but of an alternative to the rhizomatic networks of cultural contexts. 
Their creation derives from remembering a personal psychological experience of a historically profound event. Pause. Let me begin then with my childhood. Pina Bao says in What Moves Me. The war experiences are unforgettable. Zollingen suffered a tremendous amount of destruction. When the air raid sirens went off, we had to go into the smallest shelter in our garden. Once a bomb fell on part of the house as well. However, we all remained unharmed. For a time, my parents sent me to my aunts in Wuppertal because there was a larger shelter there. She thought I would be safer there. I had a small black rucksack with white polka dots with a doll peering out of it. It was always there packed, ready, so that I could take it with me when the air raid siren sounded. Such a moment occurring in the wake of contact might have occurred for Whitehead at the age of 11, that is in 1962. His grandfather had fought in the Great War. Whitehead recalls his grandfather's words while watching TV broadcasts from the USSR each May Day. Missiles. You see these? They're pointed at us, his grandfather would say. This imbued fear in his life, afraid, perhaps traumatized, helpless, he says, and in spite of that, or perhaps precisely as a response to that, he would sketch imaginary devices for cutting up nuclear weapons before they could detonate. One of these devices had the carved head of a swan. It was a black device, the swan device. And as Whitehead maintains, those devices were neither art nor technologies, but in some ways strange totemic devices. Don't dismiss those devices as silly childish toys, Whitehead quickly underlines. Hold on to the nature of such devices. Is this bad art? The way Damien Hurst would say, I can't wait to get into a position to make really bad art and get away with it. Walter Benjamin has spoken of the traditional and ritualistic values of objects, of their aura, which according to Benjamin was given to art by the bourgeoisie in the form of commissions, for example. Whitehead restates that for Benjamin, the mechanical reproduction of the industrial age made the original redundant, no longer needed. But what is the case in the post-industrial age and in what Whitehead calls the post-mechanical reproduction? In the post-industrial age, he says, digital reproduction is perfect, meaning perfectly reproducible and transmissible, even if it's spectacle, even if it's empty. Subsumed into or alienated from the system, here art galleries, institutions, software, hardware, corporate providers, the individual is caught in what Whitehead reasserts as the crisis of technology. What is to be done? Stodelat, he asks. What we're left with is a need or desire to make a work, a thing, an object, despite the alienated world we live in. The black swans have an norm, albeit one that is not from outside nor from within, intrinsic. Their aura is childish, intimately connected, I'd say, with play and pathos. And that might be because the experiences of such devices and objects, the experiences felt, occur even before we acquire language sophisticated enough to signify them. Johann Huizinga spoke about the relation of play, first with poetry, then with music and dance, in his work Homo Ludens, originally published in 1938. Pieces, in fact, is a play function, he says. It proceeds within the playground of the mind, in a world of its own, which the mind creates for it. There, things have a very different physiognomy from the one they were in ordinary life, and are bound by ties other than those of logic and causality. Then he turns to music. In feeling music, we feel ritual, he says, noting that in some languages, the manipulation of musical instruments is called playing. First and foremost, though, all play is a voluntary activity. Play to order is no longer play. It could at best be but a forcible imitation of it. And our very freedom lies precisely in our enjoyment of play. Whitehead's devices, the black swans, do function not only as objects, but as devices for the location, storage, and performance of sound works. 
Cargo Cult Unreal Replicas of Avant-Garde Music, as he says. And they are the result of pathos, not the one related to a certain wildness of hair expressing the pathos of the revolution, as uh, Huizinga traces to gentlemen inspired by early uh, Commedia dell'arte shows, uh, but a pathos connected with bad music. They run on simple, simplistic, Whitehead says, algorithms, which are nothing like the sophisticated structures of serial music. And they are manufactured from the dead waste of, waste of contemporary technology, broken computer boards and resin, among others. I'm bad. This is the last line in the text. The uncreative given of the program, the preset rendering of sound, the already given pattern, all of these never before have been considered as music, as a creative art. Even a music at its most traditional has had to affect difference, if only in popular music as a legal requirement. But music is music in the last instance, which appears in the last instance from it simply being in the first instance. It is therefore at the same time different to music and music. It is therefore new, yet not newly created. Could the last sentence of the text, I'm bad, mean or imply I'm pathetic? And if so, how? There's a connecting point, perhaps, and that is pathos. I am pathos, I'm playing, I'm playing my pathos, I'm pathetic. Recently, Eileen Miles edited the anthology Pathetic Literature, proposing a reconsideration of the word and the meaning of pathetic in relation to poetry and literature, but also in relation to life. Miles notes in their introduction that it took about a hundred years for pathetic to mean mean. It went from pathetical to pathetic in the 19th century, and it still meant something touching or pithy, felt, but then pathetic went negative real fast. Whatever brings up feeling in here must get washed. The word didn't do it by itself, but something closes in on us like a vice and all unlikely approaches will get slapped down. Pathetic means to take a little less or a little more. Shreds of stories or sounds being a little machine of feeling that bends like this or that. A book or bad music being a new mouth and lips to remake a word's intention. Pathetic is connected to pathos and thus to play. To pathos for playing, trying out, bending like this or that, taking a little more or a little less space. Objecting, resisting, sketching and building black swans. Sound devices moving us through crisis. For what moves us? I'm bad. But that doesn't mean I'm not capable of feeling pathetic. That is, of feeling. Thanks. Very nice. Thank you so much, Ioannis. Amazing. Uh, I just heard uh, from Enrique that we have uh, a few less presentations than we initially thought, so we're not completely rushed. But still, I think it might be good to go through the presentations first, and then we have, then we see how much time we have to bind everything back together. Um, so I don't know, Enrique, who you have next on your list, who might give the next presentation? Uh, the next is Ishta. Take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Love, for um, the two wonderful texts and your presentation. And um, um, it's actually good that, uh, Johannes, you expanded the text because um, I sort of decided to pivot from the text, pivot from the idea of the black swan and the idea of the totemic object. And this here, right here, is uh, my black swan. Um, she's Mowgli. And um, I'm currently working um, on a welding uh, project. And uh, there's a piece around the body um, that I'm trying to work. And I thought I could just share my first thoughts here. So uh, that, that's that's where this is. And I'm just gonna 
read out very, um, this essay interweaves lived experience of interspecies boarding for worlding new subjectivities. It moves across personal narratives and theoretical frameworks to the development of an ambitious but situated world building model. It focuses on encounters of our own stable bodies with an indie body, which is Mowgli's body. Mowgli, quite literally an indie stray dog that was born in the field next to our home, charmed us with her diabolic attitude towards the human world, was the loner in the pack, and eventually the last of the pups to survive an immediate fallout of the urgent and unthought lockdown of 2020. One fateful night at only four months old, she was attacked by a pack of dozen wild dogs. This attack shattered her spine and rendered her hind legs paralyzed. We rescued her from the attack and took her in. She has been welding us since then. This welding began with her dismantling all our ideas about what a body can do. Following the loose and Gatari, if body is an assemblage of capacities to affect and to be affected, an indie body like Mowgli's is a bodying machine that is continuously affecting and affected to have capacities and parallelly affecting and getting affected because of these capacities. This is not a super body, not an imagination of a fully formed high res body, but a minor body, a mycelial body, a body that networks across other bodies to body connected topologies. Each body is a totemic object of its environment world. Bodies here are not understood as things or objects that are fully formed, but rather as devices, processes, machines that are making the world as they move through it. In the futuring then does not work with any form of disembodiment, any practice of embodiment, but just the opposite. To in the future, a world means to pursue the bodying of all more than versions of the body as it makes itself and world in a mutual space. It is a practice of multi-bodiment, but there is no bodying without movement. So in the futuring, the world also means to move through the world across networks of micro and macro movements. I want to unpack these ideas using some semi-aphoristic statements from Erin Manning's Always More Than One, where she engages with Simone Dunn's ideas of individuation. And I will do that to um, understand bodying as a very specific form of worlding. So the first one she says is, the body is a misnomer. I don't know if it's just me, but I, I can't hear or see anything. No, I, we had a little bit of a background noise with the protagonist of the story. So I just muted myself. Um, the body is a misnomer. Nothing so stable, so certain of itself ever survives the complexity of worlding. This is Erin Manning from the book. Um, we have found an ease end quote, we have found an ease, a comfort, almost an easy way out of thinking about body by knowing the body. Thinking agency, identity, and territories through body is easy. It becomes even easier when we become certain of the form and function of the body. This certainty causes us to make the body an object for the world to engage with, or a subject that engages with the world. But what happens to the body when it has these encounters with the world? How do we account for the transformations such accounts bring? Merleau-Ponty maintained that the world transforms every time it meets the body. We call it worlding. So when the body transforms upon meeting the world, let's call it bodying. World making the body, world moving the body, bodying the body. When we first noticed Mowgli, she was a scrawny, malnourished indie dog. She was aloof, black in color, stealthy, suspicious, evasive, non-linear, and a loner within her pack. Her body carried her difference with pride. 
her earliest curiosities were tempered with trepidation. She had no fighter instinct in her puppyhood. She became a vector of flight when stressed. She camouflaged in her surroundings very quickly. She always grudgingly put her paws on the earth. The night of her attack, we saw her body die multiple times, which means it also survived multiple times. This extremely violent death and rebirth of her body was the first visceral bodying we experienced. Her running body first gave in to the fear of the wild pack. The fear led to her being frozen as they pounced on her. She hid herself in the dark of the night in overgrown grass as my partner fought off the dogs to make his way to Mowgli. She responded to me calling her name in the dark by poking her head out of the grass. We felt a relief. She is alive. Little did we know it was not the same Mowgli. We scooped her trembling body. As we walked back, my terror increased on seeing her body drenching my partner's clothes in blood. We knew nothing about dogs then. We couldn't even see where she was hurt. We reached home, laid her down. Her tail was limp, almost like a mouse's tail. Her legs couldn't move. The skin on her back was missing. Her throat was covered with bite marks. Perhaps it was shock, perhaps injury, but she didn't bark for days after. It was almost midnight. We sat with her unchanging and forever changed body through the night. Another statement that Manning makes um, in quotes, the body is a relative fact, a phase of being, end quote. Manning's project of bodying, as always more than one, seeks a post-normative understanding of body as a verb, an action, an event. Most of all, a movement moving that makes the body. This movement moving can also be understood as what Simondon calls individuation. She summarizes Simondon's contribution to the body as he liberates it from the presupposition of a form, demonstrating how a body is alive across interfacings. If the body is a relative fact, a mere phase, then it is neither the starting point nor the ending point of its being. Each relative phase of the body can be understood as two merging processes, that of individuation and that of the pre-individual. The pre-individual, which is the phaseless excess, the potential in every event, while the individuation is its own unfolding through the multiplicity of phases. The force that causes this relative phasing also always accompanies the phase. It means that this force is neither in the body nor outside of it, but all that which accompanies it. Mowgli's vet, Dr. Rana, patiently explained to us the multiple ways in which her body has altered to survive the attack. He cautioned us about unseen changes to come further down the road of her recovery. He was persistent in helping her. We put all of our efforts into her recovery, not knowing anything about the body of a dog. Learning how her body worked was a constant source of wonder. Observing how she compensated for what she had lost, therefore never created any sympathy, but only awe. We were unlearning the body as a body transformed in front of us. So this is sort of how I, I'm, I'm not nearly done with this piece, but this is how I'm sort of structuring it as a rhythm where um, um, I unpack this aphorism um, in a theoretical manner. And then there's a little narrative, um, which is the lived experience, but also um, in a sense, how I have learned about individuation uh, as Mowgli has been an example of that process, uh, not so much the individual, but um, of that process. And I'm just trying to work through that and I was hoping to get some feedback, whether you know the rhythm works, whether the structure works, whether it makes the point, I don't know. So that's where I am. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Also very moving, moving um, core around which you built this problematic, which kind of makes a oblique link with the question of pathos which is i think uh, to be 
to be uh, delved into more deeply. Yeah. Um, yeah, if it's if it's okay, we'll come back to the presentations and also to Mrs. Loves at, at the end. So I think we should go on to the next presentation. Um, Enrique, can you call up the next presenter? Sure. Uh, the next is Anna. Oh. Hey, um, so I realized, I think I got mixed up and I prepared um, material on Simon Don's text. Is that okay? <laughs> completely fine. Also, I think we're quite flexible on, um, on the presentations. It's kind of good if they also resonate one with the other so that we have a bit of a transversal thing going on. Cool. So I decided not to do slides because I was sort of overwhelmed by how many people were presenting and I didn't want to take up time reading text off of things. So um, I had the plan, though, that I would try to let's see if I can do this. How I was thinking um, to share my screen with like a couple of PDFs. Can you all see that? Yes. Cool. Wait. Yeah. So. I got really obsessed with um, reading and rereading this section, the conclusion of this Simondon text um, in the context of the other seminar that I've been in right now at the New Center, which is J.P. Caron's uh, seminar on real abstraction and the given, and sort of realizing that what Simondon is talking about in his distinction between work and techniques seems really, really close. Do you to, think you um, could just give us in the comment in in the comment section the title of uh, the full oh, title um, of the materialist yes, technology? It's J.P. Caron. I'm oh, sorry. So say one more time. Uh, who's the author of the materialist epistemology text? Oh, oh, that's uh, Kirina Cordella. So um, if you put it in the comments. That would be really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone it's might really not be in the bo in both seminars. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's it's a book that engages in a really interesting way with um, Marx's theory of commodity fetishism and Alfred Zonretel's theory of real abstraction. So um, what I'm going to try to argue is that the um, distinction that Simondon makes between work and techniques is really close to the distinction that um, can be made within a Marxist context between commodity fetishism and um, something that wouldn't be reducible to commodity fetishism, maybe some other kind of exchange, what you could argue that Karatani calls mode of exchange D. Um, so there's a, a sentence in particular that really stuck out to me in this conclusion of Simon Don's is, the hierarchical distinction of the manual and the intellectual does not affect the world of technical objects. This of course is the same kind of general framing that Alfred Zonretel tries to pursue in his critique of um, epistemology as a reflection of the distinction between intellectual and manual labor, not just in production, but also in economic exchange. Um, what's also really interesting here as an aside is the fact that in J.P. Carroll's essay on this, he draws on um, this concept of the operational scheme from Jose Giannotti, which is also a term <laughs> that Simondo uses in a different context, operational schema. But uh, to sort of try to sum up briefly the concepts, um, I would say the most important thing here is that, um, so look, so this means that the abstract and the material are determined not by the chemical consistency of a given thing, but contextually. Similar, Simon Don develops the distinction between work and techniques in terms of whether the focus is on the, the distinct terms of the interaction or whether the focus is on the relation. I think this allows us to have a kind of a non-humanist approach to the concept of commodity fetishism, as opposed to sort of reification, where instead of trying to see it as the um, ch changing of a social relation to a relation between things, we can actually see it as the um, shifting of the relational dimension of some kind of process of engagement with the environment into something where the two terms are isolated from each other as things instead of as a relation. And in this text, Cordella talks often about this idea of reconceiving the social in Marx and Zonretel as um, something sort of strictly relational and structural that isn't necessarily a matter of the anthropological or the human. Um, so in this sense, I think there's a really interesting dimension of, um, I think, greater compatibility between Simon Don's theory of alienation and Marx's theory of commodity fetishism rather than um, the sort of Marxist theory of alienation that Simon Don focuses on critiquing. Um, and um, by sort of pursuing this thread, I think you, you can also get some really interesting resources um, 
for not just talking about this in terms of, um, you know, the ways that people sort of constitute their, um, you know, engagement with technical objects, but also the ways that exchange sort of structurally processes those objects in a network. So I've been really interested in the idea of different forms or modes of exchange and how those exchanges might, for example, um, either kind of fetishize aspects of what is in the exchange as separate from the network of exchange the, of the exchange itself, or to embed those things within the exchange and understand the exchange on its own terms. There's a really interesting part of this conclusion here. I'm not sure I can pull it up quite exactly. Um, but um, yeah, the obscure central zone that Simon Don talked about, I've been really interested in this as basically it's very similar to what um, Cordela talked about in terms of the fact that, um, yes, so the unconscious, um, that she, she argues that manual labor under capitalist production and exchange is unconscious, whereas it's the um, intellectual labor that kind of serves as the network that represses that unconscious. And that um, the manual labor that I think she's talking about is very similar to the one that Simonon is talking about in terms of the obscure central zone, which would be the site of the kind of more interiority of the relation rather than the opposition of the opposed terms that you either enter into in the act of the constitution of the technical object or in the act of commodity exchange. Um, so I was definitely thinking that there was an interesting parallel there and also, um, I didn't pull up the PDF, but Kojin Karatani has very interesting arguments about his idea for a mode of exchange D, which I think is also compatible with Tacnex, the obscure central zone, the unconscious, all of this. He argues explicitly it's unconscious, um, but there's basically this idea of he sees it as sort of, you know, an alternative to capitalism, where um, the way that people would enter into relations with each other wouldn't be based on opposing these sort of different terms in this, in this way, um, but actually sort of taking into account that kind of parallax as he talks about it as an unconscious space that actually provides the terms of the um, kind of pre-individual orientation of the space. <laughs> That's kind of the gist of what I was what I was working on. Wow, that was incredibly rich. I, I hope that you're going to write the essay about this. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. <laughs> no, I mean, even, I mean, this looks also like a really ambitious kind of parallel reading and maybe a short essay is not going to be enough <laughs> but i i would just say about the essays then um it it's uh it's an okay space to also map out how such an essay in a longer form could look mm -hmm. you could think of it like an extended abstract for instance and say the, this is the way that uh this kind of a parallel critical reading could could pan out or could work out. These are the core axes because this is would be really fascinating to pursue as well. Um, sure. Yeah, amazing. I, if I'm not wrong, so we've had three presentations now and two uh, have been withdrawn. Is that right? So we yeah, we've, we've done all the presentations. That's really nice. So we've got like, if we can go like 15 minutes over, we've got half an hour to discuss. Is that is that okay with everyone? Enrique, is that okay with you as well? Because you're, you're yeah, sure, no problem. Hostage here to have to um, as a model <laughs> to keep the keep the session open. Yeah, so so rich. What an amazing session with, with the presentations as well, and um, you know, starting with this super high voltage presentation by Mr. Slav. I really, I'm kind of gobsmacked to be honest. So I'm gonna let leave the floor to you or to, to ask the first questions. And if there's an awkward silence, I'll, I'll kind of throw in my questions, which I have already. Maybe, um, I don't know, Mr. Slav, if you have any comments to make about the presentations. Mm, uh, yes, perhaps uh, I wanted to stress why did I chose this, uh, why did I chose this text of Jliad? James Whitehead, because it seemed interesting to me. Can we consider those things which he discusses as a uh, creation of a technical object, which is neither art nor not nor a device or a play, a notion of uh, Heizing, which he brings up? Can we consider this to be the individual's rebel 
against technopolitics as an impersonal subject of enunciation, an impersonal uh, power, like micro power of Foucault, of the producer or uh, things. So it's an open question to me, can we consider this, uh, the creation of these devices, which have no particular um, purpose in a sense of contemporary capitalism, which rationalizes things, aligning them or pinning them down to a certain domain uh, by commodifying them. Can such things be considered as a loner's rebel? Yes. And I, if I will just jump in until everyone else uh, is ready to um, ask their questions. I, one of the things when I listened to you, um, Mrs. Love, and I obviously it was a beautiful bridge between the Techni and Monoculture seminar and the one about Simondon and uh, nature, the nature of things, and also you know the uh, the concept of the nature of things, but also the concept of nature, and it made me think about especially that your, your um, kind of bringing also Guattari and Deleuze back into the fold, it made me think about this question of uh, techno diversity um, as something that can be thought in a non-formal analogy with biodiversity and also cultural diversity. So how can objects, technical lineages like this that could become a technical lineage, but that does not lend itself to commodification, how can this be one of the aspects of a techno scientific rationality that is not subsumed by capitalism? That that was very much, um, I think, at the heart of the techne and uh, techne beyond monoculture seminar. But it then comes back also to thinking about um, the essence of technical objects and the relationship with our concepts of nature and the nature of things. I don't know if that makes sense at all. If you want to respond to that, and I, I see Anna has her hand up as well. Mm. Um, I don't know how to answer directly. Well, then don't, just... don't don't feel obliged because it's just I was just um, trying to see how how this can all fit together, how we can kind of. I just uh, may uh, say that uh, I think that techno diversity is uh, just as I have tried to show is defined not only by the nature of things by but by the order of things as well yes very much very much um so if i could jump in with something to you i actually one of my favorite parts of mr slav's technopolitics presentation was the um that he brought in this concept of the subject of the enunciation um and specifically how that connected with the rest of the way he was framing it because what's interesting is that you know Cordela, who was one of the texts that I I brought up in a little presentation, um, the subject of the enunciation is a central ethical concept in her work, and she tends to emphasize it in terms of um, precisely this kind of space of like you know what I've been sort of framing as the technics work distinction. You could also argue that she would frame it kind of almost in terms of the distinction between subject of enunciation and the subject of the statement, where it's like on the level of the statement or on the level of the capitalist discourse. Um, would be the space where you would have, um, you know, the sort of constitution of meaning in terms of these oppositions, in terms of the conscious space where the unconscious of manual labor, technics or whatever is repressed and excluded. But um, for Cordela to take a position of the subject of the enunciation or in the space of like lung and its function of naming, just pure naming without necessarily having um, discursive meaning, um, she sort of tends to frame this in terms of this is sort of, you know, the differential structure conceived on its own terms or sort of from within the process. So you could actually argue that um, there's a whole reading you could do of this concept of the subject of, of the enunciation or the position of the enunciation um, in terms of technics and in terms of um, in terms of this sort of processual or like unconscious pre-individual dimension. Mrs. Lab, did you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I suppose it's interesting, especially in context when we speak about uh, Marxist critique of ideology and uh, ideology as a form of false consciousness. We may speak of thinking about this split between enunciation as an act 
or as an activity or as practice or as uh, the result of some normative commitments. And there is a gap between this uh, dimension of enunciation and subjectivity with regards to it and uh, the consciousness as false consciousness in the age of uh, capitalism. When all the forms of consciousness by Marx and Engels, as they put it, are necessarily false forms of consciousness because because uh, just as it goes in Brasia's text for today seminar, which we follow for JP, uh, uh, all this sociality is necessary dissocial uh, in the age of capitalism. I have some thoughts, but I thought I would pass it to Ishta because she has her hand. Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking about what you brought up about uh, techno diversity, and um, it it made me think of this uh, the practice of jagad as a as a technicity, which is essentially um, I, I'll just put this in here. Um, it's 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 very it started in india and then now there are management books being written about it so you know it also sort of um this is a hindi word and um it is um it's sort of making do with what you have available to uh, come to the cheapest fastest and most accessible solution to a technical problem Right, and uh, it, it started within um, quite literally the group of people uh, who did not have access to technology like the Indian middle class would have, uh, who did not transact technological solutions with money, but they made their own um, makeshift solutions. So Jagad is also makeshift, but it is also completely non-normative. At least that's how it historically started as a practice. And then this form of utilization of the resources at hand um, made their way into management schools and management circles, and it, it almost then became standardized. And this also made me think of, Cecile, what you were talking about in the previous class, that you know, this something which is so unique, because there, there are no two situations which will have the same amount of scarcity, the same amount of inaccessibility, and the same amount of you know, um, found objects at hand through which a technical solution could be made up. And then um, the, the, the reverse, the reversification of Jagard that happened was to create situations through which those, um, to create the situations for something like found objects, uh, aesthetics to be produced, right? So um, I was, and then that reminded me of Ms. Disla, what you were talking about uh, when you were distinguishing between what can have technopolitics and what can't have technopolitics, right? And within that category, Jagad is something that wouldn't have technopolitics uh, because of its origins and because of its sources. Um, and yet then the appropriation of this practice by the management schools and therefore by capitalism brings it into the realm of, you know, creation of technopolitics. And I was just thinking about that uh, across the two points that you made. Actually, uh, I'm grateful for the concept that you brought out because as far as I have managed to read it from Wikipedia, we may call it a guerrilla technopolitics, right. like rebel, like a subversion of magistral uh, capitalist technopolitics, but as a parallel movement. So something in between uh, the things which are not subjected to technopolitics and are subjected. Guerrilla is the best word, word I suppose. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. But the only thing is that the guerrilla also has like a connotation of resistance into it. Whereas uh, Jugard has more of a res uh, connotations of survival, uh, more than resistance, you know? and. I mean, it's, it's a very, very small nuance, but uh, it, it is more concerned with making do than, um, you know. Uh, can, you, can you repeat, Mrs. Love, as a, as a guerrilla? Yeah, guerrilla. Like partisan warfare. <laughs> no, but as a, what was the other word that you used with it as a guerrilla? Uh, it was not technopolitics or, yeah? 
te guerrilla techno politics? Yes. I'm just writing it down because I am afraid that we would uh, lose it later. I put it in, in the chat here because I, I really think this is uh, quite a gem to find this and to put it in, to plug it into this theoretical context. It, it, it might be thought as a part of a concept uh, on which I'm working on, uh, resi the resistance culture. Not a culture of resistance, but resistance as a form of life in the Shetinian sense. So this is a component, maybe. Because resistance is aligned with survival. For example, uh, um, you know, uh, the historical persecution of Jewish people, they had to form a resistance culture to survive throughout the ages before, before having their own state and so on. So this is a form of life of the oppressed as such. This is a part. I suppose it can be incorporated to a form of life of the oppressed. I find it. Wow. Yeah, it's super interesting. There was something else that I was actually just thinking of in this conversation. Um, and Ishita brought up this thing about like where technopolitics does and doesn't apply. There's a really interesting distinction that he hasn't written anything on it that's been published yet, but um, Gabriel Tupinamba, who's a psychoanalyst and philosopher, um, he uh, has developed this really interesting reading of Karatani's modes of exchange, where um, there are specific sort of forms of communication that tend to be privileged in each mode. So you could say in gift economies, it tends to be speech. In sort of more state organized economies, it tends to be writing. And in more market economies, it tends to be objects. Um, what I found really interesting thinking about this is this idea that technopolitics might kind of enter a different phase in terms of not just um, communication, but also like law or like sort of social binding and almost in a sort of legal sense through the force of technical objects, right? Because it's sort of like, um, how should I put this exactly? There's this great passage in Paul Livingston's book, The Politics of Logic, where he analogizes Plato's discussion of like the lawgivers or whatever with um, Wittgenstein's discussions about like how it is that we end up speaking the way that we do, like where the rules actually come from. Um, and I, I think you would actually argue that, you know, especially in a capitalist context, technopolitics is intimately connected to this. And it's like who has, who sort of controls or organizes or directs like, you know, no one themselves really does it, but people are in, in different positions within the network, right? But who sort of involves themselves in this regime of the like creation and destruction of communicative objects? I feel like it's in many ways a more powerful sort of force of discursive law than even the sort of juridical structures of capitalism, right? That we have, we live in a, a era where like objects are kind of like the dominant form of how we and sort of articulate with it and like interrelate each other. So this whole type of political framing is really exciting to me. Like, and I'm really interested in this way of maybe looking at it in terms of like, you know, that kind of rereading of the platonic like lawgiver. Like I think the people who maybe are doing that now actually are the are the techno pop politicians. <laughs> yes, great point. That is why actually I have added to the readings list, but we have haven't got the presentation. Uh, the Foucault's work, which is called the Critique of Political Reason, where he just uh, puts uh, speaks about these intersections and uh, overlapping of law, uh, the rule, rule being behavior, and how it can be connected just to what you have said to technopolitical issues. When, for example, company has two technopolitical options, but because of the law imposed on the action of technopolitical agent, it remains with one only option available because the law prohibits the second possible technopolitical decision. And yes, so it's like a superstructure imposing on a base in, if we will speak more simply in Marxist terms. Can you put the reference in the in the comments as well for people like me? I never I never hear uh, names properly when it's kind of. Uh, and what? what the the reference, the author you just mentioned, I didn't hear the name. Ah, it was written uh, Foucault to what critique of political ah, sorry, reason. Sorry, sorry, I thought okay. Yes, it's in the chat and in the syllabus. 
So one I, other thing I that, oh, sorry. Um, one other thing that also this made me think of is some of the really interesting work done by people like Benjamin Bratton on like platforms and like platform logic and um, like Galloway's stuff on protocols. I feel like there's this really interesting direction that a lot of the sort of exciting political theory nowadays is taking that is sort of looking at like, like you can talk about technopolitics kind of maybe in some ways as a more kind of empirical dimension maybe of this kind of analysis of platform structures and like how that also you can talk about like um, Patricia Reed's like platform cosmologies stuff, which I'm really excited about. And I would love to like pursue a little bit more. It seems like in a way that's almost kind of like a step back version of like technopolitics, which is sort of more like getting right in into the actual like constitution of those regimes of the platform cosmologies as they as they develop or something like that. I think there's a really potentially exciting overlap there as well. Yes. Um, would it be possible at all to come back uh, to this notion of uh, pathos that was mentioned in um, Ioannis' presentation? Because it seems to bind also uh, the kind of spectrum of what Ishita brought into uh, into this session with uh, with her presentation, and then and it seems to me a, a possible way to reintegrate the concept of nature. Because in a way, this is uh, just to bring back the technopolitics into the wider framework of thinking about the relation between techno and nature, which is something we haven't really done in the discussion yet. Um, so this is just a kind of stimulus I throw out there and want to see if also some of, of those of you who haven't spoken yet, if you if you have any thoughts, either about this or others. No, didn't. Did, were there any thoughts about how how this technopolitics relates to the to the question of nature? Difficult one. I mean, I think, I guess you could talk about it in terms of like the problem of extractive logic, which is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, where it's kind of like, I mean, a lot of what it seems like technopolitics is focusing on is this issue of control, right? And like how we control the objects that we use in our our day-to-day -day lives, but also our like general, like broader scheme of <laughs> self and social reproduction. Um, and like, I think there are definitely different ways of orienting towards control and what is always sort of being oriented towards in terms of control is what is framed to us as the natural, right? So I feel like there's an interesting dimension here and this is also, I can totally see why it would connect to the pathetic or to pathos or whatever is thinking about, you know, are there ways of approaching these technical political questions where it's not a matter of like the sort of law giving or like almost juridical form of the engagement with or the management of objects, but it's sort of a more, maybe a little bit more like cybernetic kind of like, you know, you can bring in these aspects of the organic or like organic forms that um are sort of self-constituting instead of like, you know, controlling the um scope of what nature is or can be. Wow, that's a very good stab at the question. I think, are there any other thoughts about how, um, for example, how the way that Simon Don relativizes the distinction between techne and nature or doesn't make it a kind of sharp opposite one to the other. So in this idea of extraction, it, it, as you say, there is a kind of nature that is construed around technopolitics as something to be extracted. But are there other ways of thinking about the relation between technopolitics, technical objects, and um, and this question both of nature as, as a kind of wider category, metaphysical category, and the nature of things. Perhaps one of such frameworks may be considered uh, what, again, Guattari, for example, defines as a disjunctive synthesis between mm -hmm. the machines of production, material culture, nature, and the produced thing. So it's like, a, uh, like Anna said, 
logical extraction. So the disjunctive synthesis may be considered as a sort of logic of this extraction. So there are some gaps um, between material culture of human, for example, human species, uh, what essentially is called human nature and how it's uh, organized its way of machinic, uh, disjunctive synthesis of the machines of production, machines of creation, machines of reproduction, recreation, replication, machines of elimination and the incorporation of technopolitical decisions into some of the acts of these relations between the elements of this synthesis. Yeah, this I is think one of the possible frameworks. A, a very good one to take forward as well. I think it's, yeah. As a, yeah, thank you. And in a way, that's what you brought in already by referring to Watari earlier as well, that it's, um, it's good, I think, to make it explicit that this would be one of the other, any other, <clears throat> other potential paradigms, potential frameworks, do you think that, that might take us in a different direction? Or do you think this is, this would be a, a kind of the most fruitful way of, of integrating these different types of thought? Mm, I think they're, they're not limited to what I have proposed. I no, no, of I course. I was just thinking if anybody else had also what's about this um go ahead joe um this is just maybe a a thought or something that uh, uh, i thought of uh, regarding uh, simon don nature and technicity and all that especially mrs love's uh, great presentation on technopolitics um there's this uh that weird dynamic when Pitching, pitching an idea to grant giving bodies. And sometimes you have a single idea for a film, uh, for example. And when you pitch this, uh, you kind of remold the idea again and again to fit the uh, certain themes of certain grant giving bodies for you to be able to materialize your uh, the screenplay, you know, to make a film and um it's kind of interesting how uh to think about nature in that context where you constantly um remold uh the object or the, the idea basically um uh, and uh but there's something that uh the essence remains in a way you know even uh even um if, even if you imagine if you made this through this you made the film through this certain grant giving body and uh, and this other one uh, and so you made two films but they the nature um or the essence of your idea for the film um still like persists in a way there's some sort of resistance and persistence there um and yeah that's that kind of reminded me of uh, um, all the uh, discussion recently. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very, very good point. Would you link that? Yeah. It has something in common with what Michael Marder on the other seminar has called reconfiguring nature, when nature is taken as a draft, which is to be reconfigured. Maybe what Gio has talked is relation to this. What, do you, what does it ring up? Does it sound uh, related, Joe? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's exactly what. I <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are there are there any other thoughts or ideas or questions? Maybe one or two before we before we close. Should, should we then um, take this as an opportunity to say a big thank you to every, oh, there's Amy who says, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, there's Amy who just put a link in there towards her work. Amazing, I kind of, cool, I just clicked on it. 
Um, good. Yeah, in that case, I, I would say thank you to everyone who gave presentations today and uh, Mrs. Love for this super deep uh, engagement with the with the problematic proposed in the in the seminar and in this really intense presentation you gave. I, I can't wait to read this as a paper when it when it comes together. It's going to be amazing, and I look forward also to the essays that come out of the presentations from today. This this was a really good session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. See ya.